Kelly, welcome to the show, mate. Always a pleasure to get to spend an hour with you, my friend. <laughs> uh, me too. It's a, it's a delight to actually sort of finally sit down and get this conversation going. We've been speaking. Do people, do people understand that I basically begged you to create a podcast so that we could hang out for an hour, even though you're in Prague and I'm in San Francisco? I mean, I don't think people understand <clears throat> our A, our friendship, and B, how influential you are on my thinking and understanding of how the world works. And see that you're such a legend that I don't get to hang out with you. That is very kind, overly kind, and obviously completely false. But yeah, that's very nice. Did they did they tell you that I'd interrupted a family holiday of yours, and that was when I sabotaged your family holiday in Paris? There's another. Perhaps, it, <laughs> perhaps the perhaps the bromance works both ways. It, you know? it's, um, it is, and you know, I haven't yet taken you on head to head in a, a sprint at your your daughter's uh, like <laughs> you know high school field day or middle school or elementary school field day. So I really haven't paid you back in kind, except that day will come. That reckoning will come. Okay, I look forward to that day. Um, I'm not sure when it's going to happen, but I'll start <laughs> some training. Uh, I better do some sprinting before that day. Otherwise, <laughs> thank you. I just had my knee replaced. I'm like, I better do some sprinting too. Otherwise, I'm gonna have yeah. my knee replaced. The last time I got involved in something like that was against one of the physios at Arsenal, and we had GPS on our backs for a race mm. that was basically um, a game for some of the players, and it was a pitch length. And I accelerated. I think he got a full start. The other guy. I accelerated. Then I put the foot down. In, in a sort of 40-year-old style. And I hit 8.6 meters per second, which I was very pleased with. But at that point, I felt something in my hamstring. And then my choppy stride sort of got even shorter. And I had to hang on for the last 30 meters of the race because I definitely tore my hamstring um, <laughs> in that race. So, Look, if, we, if we're going to set up this whole conversation, it's important to know is this is an allegory <clears throat> for two really important concepts. One... Did you win? Yes or no? Absolutely. Uh, okay, I coasted so over the line. Yeah. You have now just explained our entire sports model for the last three decades, four decades. As long as you win, it was worth it. It doesn't matter if we have to re- put you in the rubbish bin and recycle your bones and you are a gladiator and we give your body to the lions. We were entertained. So really, like, <laughs> let's just be transparent about – we really don't care about the durability of health of our athletes. We care about winning – and, and winning solves a lot of problems, right? The second thing That's... is that me- <laughs> what gets measured gets, ma- gets managed, right? And as yeah. soon as I think uh, there's a, this old thing that as soon as you observe a behavior, the behavior changes, you know, that's, uh, that's a kind of key understanding of behavior. And I, I think ultimately what we're going to see in this conversation is that it all comes down to how do we shape and change human behavior, whether that's uh, – understanding patterns, whether that's changing how an athlete or a team manages something, how someone thinks about, you know, stress and strain. Uh, The whole thing is ultimately about the relationship between human being and environment and how do we manipulate those things. Strength conditioning, eating, nutrition, performance, sleep, all that stuff. Those are just aspects of that original concept of behavior change. I think that kind of leads us, we'll, we'll dig into a bit of a conversation rather than talk about our sprint race now. Um, <laughs> like the Ready State podcast, which, uh, you know, is a great resource, is one of many resources you've come up with and, um, you know, is, is out there, covers a wide range of concepts. Okay. So like from your perspective, if you're thinking about what makes an athlete ready to perform, what are your kind of major keys to success do you think when we're when we're thinking about that uh i'm gonna go with who were their parents how lucky were they um th- how much dysfunction did they have with their father so that they could then show up and turn that teenage angst into some like dysfunctional way of meaning of coping do i sound do i sound ironic and bitter it's our not yes of course look ultimately let's start with a peel back for a second and just say the human brain is the most sophisticated structure in the known universe. I think right now, if you're a physio or performance athlete or performance coach, you can hear this and say, okay, I, I get that. We, we, we're spending a lot of time on top-down processing ideas right now. That's very hot. Whether we're talking about persistent pain, chronic pain management, arousal, anxiety, 
And certainly those things we know to be very true. Look at, um, <clears throat> you know, S Simone Biles in the Olympics. She's the greatest gymnast in the history of the world. She says to her coach, I'm, I don't, I don't, I'm not ready to perform today. All anyone needed to say was great. Trust you. You know, because you're, you're a team, teammate and you're the best, right? Not, you know, where we get wrong, which is just something. It's not wrong. With it. It's not wrong for her to say, I know myself so well that this is it. And simultaneously, look at, you know, the tennis player who made some really mansplaining, you know, comments about it and then threw a fit and left the Olympics and left it, you know. So the pressure is real. And that top down approach, we have to manage that better and give our, make our athletes more durable and robust. What's interesting about that is the bottom-up processing piece, I feel like sometimes gets poor sort of relevance. So if we're talking about pain, there's a lot of things I can do from bottom-up processing, from desensitization, decongestion, movement, breath, sleep, nutrition. I can change a lot of the native physiology or influence the native physiology, get the body out of the way of itself so it can do its normal process or I can enhance its normal processes. Like, you know, if you sprint for an hour and then sit, it's not really a good way to decongest and manage what my friend Ben calls session cost, right? That's not, you're going to pay a higher session cost because you sort of didn't consummate the, the physiologic cycle from that level of load. So simultaneously, you know, some of these things aren't very sexy. Um, you know, it's easy for in the sports performance thing to say we can't prevent injury. We can't. And then we'll, we'll dance around and use these funny words like injury mitigation, mit injury attenuation. You know, I'm like, no, no, no. We can prevent injury. We do things like fuel, sleep, right? We, our athletes feel safe. Um, they feel seen. They, you know, I mean, th the research around sleep and injury correlation is very high. And so, you know, if I, if I can guarantee that you're getting sleep, and that means I need to track sleep. I need to really understand. I need to understand the inputs how you're self-soothing to come down after a big match, right? Suddenly you really are like, wow, that's really complex because my athletes had to get on a bus and fly three time zones, right? And then they had this crap, and that's welcome to be a professional sport. So what do we control? So coming back to your question, the real question is saying, how can we control what we can control? And my hypothesis is that the human being is so robust, and if you give good athletes the ball, and set them up to win, you've cleared all the – then you can just let the athletes win. And the best athlete wins. The best team wins. The best training wins. Not who managed to get more vegetables and, you know, high-quality proteins down their athletes and sleep or, you know. So ultimately when we're talking about readiness, which is why we, we call this the ready state, we have to look at these top-down psychosocial, psycho-emotional components to how does my athlete connect. If you really want a good ax a, a indication of this, watch the TV show Ted Lasso right now. And everyone in professional you know, football right now is like, oh, Ted Lasso. But as an allegory for how do I teach and treat human beings? Like that's what that means. Of course, it's not realistic, whatever. But that's a show that's all about the psychology and the humanness and nothing about the actual mechanical, physiologic preparation performance. Training age, genetics, luck, right? All of those things really integrate. Let me give you a good example. Andre de Grasse is our current fastest man on the universe, right? He's the heir apparent to Usain Bolt. Um, he's a really young sprinter. He was a, basically a basketball player in high school and then got chosen by the track coach. And so he's still just learning his trade. And I've met Andre and had the pleasure of working with Andre and know his coach very well. And what I'll say is, <clears throat> I don't know about what his last few years have looked like training, but his training when I've worked with him and around that was that he isn't a great training athlete. But as soon as there's enough arousal, he turns on and becomes a mutant. So he's not the fastest training day athlete, he's the fastest competitor athlete. So you have to know that about him and still go along with how do we control all these other variables and keep him as ready as possible. So, you know, one of the things you and I have talked about for a long time is, you know, the new role in, in professional sports and professional athletics is this performance coach. But really that's the person who's trying to say, how do I control for as many of these variables and control for as much leakage as I can? Then we can just say, is this athlete ready to be coached? Do we have a, a coaching schema? 
that allows the incredible genetics of these mutants to shine. And that's what it comes down to. What you'll see is that it's confusing from the outsider, potentially, but Juliet and I get to interview CEOs and world champions and nutritionists and coaches, and all of those things inform how we think about trying to take the lessons of sports and performance, high-level human performance, and actually transcend them into transforming society. And it turns out that's just a scalability issue. So once again, how can we help you control for as many variables as you, as you want to control for that don't leave you leave feeling like a robot or an automaton or a person who lives off a spreadsheet, right? That these things are baked in as just simple behaviors. You've constrained the environment so that you get the right outcome. There was a time, let me give you an example. There was a time where my good friend, Ben Ashworth, was, um, you know, first team physio at this little soccer club. And you guys started delivering food to the players from Harrods. And there was a big pushback initially because these teenage millionaires were having dinner delivered to them. And one of the things that you said was, well, you know, look, if you're a 19 or 22 year old superstar and someone delivers you high quality food, you eat it and you don't go out getting chips and pizza and smashing yourself. And, and that's a great example of saying, hey, here's how we can constrain the behavior so that we don't have to worry about it. Right. And, it, and that's the way we're trying to think about people. If you don't want to you know, eat a bunch of crap at home, don't buy a bunch of crap at home. If you want to, you know, nosh on all the fruit you want, just make sure that fruit is the only thing that you can open the drawer and, and gorge on. So that's what's interesting to me is seeing now, one, what are those behaviors? What are the best ways to shape and enhance that behavior? And two, really trying to understand how those complex behaviors interact. Yeah, that's covered off a lot of things. And I, I think what I think about that is this, you know, uh, I suppose you have to go through the process of going from a more, when you're working with a team sport, as an example, you go through this kind of approach, where, which is global, we set up a system, um, and you have to do something that's going to probably reach 70% of those athletes. You're probably going to miss out on 30%, but you just get mm. something in place. It's a good system of working, and you're going to be effective in 70% of cases, let's say. But definitely... In recent times, and this is quite a buzz, is coming around to the kind of N equals one game and looking at individualization. And I think there's something that's beyond being able to quantify, you know, whether you're wearing technology, whether you're measuring force production, whether you're looking at measuring range of motion change, all those other data driven decisions. I think when it comes down to it, actually that one to one and that truly understanding the athlete and allows you to be a little bit more able to provide them with individualized planning, programming, food, nutrition, advice, all those other bits and pieces. And I know working with some colleagues who work in sports where they can control that, that's what their aim is. And how, how you scale that then to um, the wider population is difficult because maybe coaching resources, contact time, all those other bits and pieces. So, you know, how, how have you seen people go about that challenge with the trying to, rather than giving out generalized advice, is to try and scale that to become much more individual in the focus? It, you're really at the heart of the, the question here, is that every human being is deeply unique and deeply individual with a, with a behavior set, an experience, uh, a blueprint of pattern, um, and yet simultaneously principles are principles. Like, yeah, you may only need 7.5 and I might need 8.5 hours of sleep. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what we're talking about, right? Like the small term. And for the average person, when we hit the generalization of principles, we cover the rocks, right? It's enough because as our friend Franz Bosch says, there's more variation in waltzing than there is in sprinting, which means that low load, low speed, low stress, low strain, there's a lot more tolerance for variability in the system. As the system starts to get under higher scrutiny, higher forces, higher sort of repetition, higher volumes, we start to see that all best practices really closely approximate each other. One of the things that, that jumps in my head when you're speaking that is, who is the stakeholder here? And how have we empowered her to be able to control that? Well, it turns out the stakeholder is the athlete. And 
now ask the question, how much and how ready and how willing is that athlete to own that process themselves? Am I an external process where I'm trying to measure the monkey from outside? I don't speak the monkey's language. I don't know how the monkey feels. I don't know if the monkey is tired of bananas, right? But I have all these monitors on this monkey when I can teach this person, this human to own those things and be able to turn the knobs up and down. This works for me. This doesn't work for me. What we see is a fundamental failure of empowerment and teaching the central only stakeholder in that how to feel, how to make decisions, how to critically evaluate what best practice is for him and her in the context of a bigger system. So that suddenly that person who's in the middle says, you know what, man, I've been eating this whey protein and it gives me diarrhea. Well, and then it turns out that of course that that person is Lactose intolerant it doesn't handle that bulk pr- whey processing side effect of, of you know cattle and dairy processing as a protein source. You put them on, and this is these are this is a true story, right? Among a really excellent excellent hockey team, they get them on a vegetarian post you know plant based protein sport. Post sport, yes, is beef better? Yes, but is it difficult to eat a beef sandwich after a game? Yes, it's so we we get it. Like some of this is what what is the best choice available to me in this moment? I'll make that choice. You switch this athlete onto something that doesn't look like whey anymore, and they absorb iron, and their diarrhea goes away, and their stomach and gas. That that's that idea where an athlete has to be empowered, and just can't, you can't also just back the dump truck up and put it on the the kid, right? We're seeing. Um, you know, a generation of football, you know, I mean like international football athletes suddenly who've grown up and are owning the process a little bit more. They're not passive. Part- I don't know why my Achilles ruptured. I just woke up one day and it was like that. These kids are starting to become sophisticated, starting to become empowered and educated and are really, you know, part of the dyad of conversation. And guess what? That's the definition of expert clinicianship. It's a conversation between patient and provider or athlete and coach. It's not this top-down patriarchal model, which is still how we're trying to process. But what we have is a generation of athletes who aren't ready or who haven't been set up for success to own this whole process about, you know, who, who, where should the soft tissue work be done to reduce session costs or to downregulate or to address something that feels stiff? Not in the weight room, not but before we have the match, not on the on the pitch, right? This is to be done by the athlete before they go to bed because that's what it means to be an athlete, right? Who's responsible for setting up the sleep? Well, it turns out it's the athlete, right? Unless so you mean you might have to come in and teach someone this and say, you gotta own this. And by the way, we can track it for a while until we get our hands on this. But that's I think this the central idea is we need to do a better job through the strata through the sort of the, the column of athletic development, it was saying, hey, this is what it means. You have to drink some water. Yes, you know, when you finish the match, you probably, did you eat breakfast today? You know, it's not, did you get this turmeric at, you know, this 1.75 hours past? Like, I think we've really gone deep on misplaced precision. And the second component to your conversation is, how many athletes do you have? What is the specificity and resources that you can deliver this individualization on? Oh, you have, how many, how many members are on a professional football team? Well, let's like say, look, yeah, looking about 27, let's say, okay. 28, 27. So let's say you got 27, 28, Tour de France, maybe there's 12 guys or eight guys, right? Okay, now I'm running a university and I have 600 kids in my program. So this suddenly changes the scope and dynamics of this. Oh, I'm, I'm in charge. I have one head coach, one strength conditioning coach for an entire high school, right? So at some point, what you start to say is, well, what is it? Is it a coach? I can control and how do more importantly, how did I leave this athlete? Did I leave? There's a great uh, conversation out of volleyball. I really like it's called improving the ball probably works in all sports, but if you touched it, you tried to put it in a better position. You tried to improve the ball that I really like this idea. And Holt, ultimately, if you're in a performance, you're a physio, you're a strength coach. I, I, by the way, I don't know what the differences between those two things are. And um, <laughs> at some point, I'm going to run into an athlete who's like, I know all of this. Like, what's your job here, sir? Like, I, I run all of this myself. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay, my work here is done. You know, I've got, I work three hours a week, not the, uh, what we're currently seeing, which is playing whack-a-mole because we don't even have some ground rules or operations in order. So, again, 
You need to know the scale at what you're working and the resources that you're managing. That will that will dictate a lot of the things that I'm I'm trying to implement and the conversations and the generality of principles. And two, how prepared is the athlete to own her experience? So that when Simone Biles, who is a consummate athlete, says, I'm not ready to go, you're like, mm, you're not ready to go. Let's not have you go. We, we, we have a deep enough roster that I trust you, right? Yeah, that, as, as you were sort of speaking about that there and, and some of that ownership, it's, it's quite interesting how still different athletes, even with that education piece, um, still prefer the passive approach. You know, like if I'm, if I'm going to get my, get rid of some tissue soreness after competing or training hard, I'd much rather go lie on a bed and get a massage, you know, than Sounds great. Actively. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I suppose it comes down to, okay, education, number one, like this is a way you can solve this problem yourself. Um, but that, you know, that transition of changing that passive culture, I mean, what we did, what we did after your visit to Arsenal, we had a very big focus on, on closing, if, closing the loop, right? So we would get athletes to come in in the morning, players would come in, they check a particular movement as an example, uh, that was not general, but was their own specific movement where they could tune into their body. And it might have been an overhead squat. It might have been a pistol squat. It might have been, you know, a, a, a lat stretch of some sort, whatever it was. First thing they'd come in, they'd do that. Okay. Doesn't feel the same. Feels a little bit different to normal. So I know I've got three strategies here that usually will work to fix this or to at least um, make a change. And if they could do that themselves. They could retest that movement pattern and they could close that loop. Now, at the same time, what we had on offer was me with my bed or someone else with a physio bed in there who could then help them to solve it if they couldn't solve it themselves. And that's the way we started to educate players. You know, Have you done it yourself? Have you tried those things that we know work? But that took time, right? It takes time to show them, to educate them, to spend time with them one-to-one -one to get them to buy into it to the point where you can say, look, you know, go and go down there and try your hip mobe, try this, try that stretch, whatever, before they would come to you. That's a big shift in culture, particularly if you're dealing with athletes who are worth millions, you know, teenage millionaires who are delivered food from Harrods, who are used to getting, you know, spoon fed a little bit. And I think that's, um, that's something that we found takes a long time. You know, you're in for the long game there. You're trying to, you're trying mm. to hugely change a culture and it's not just going to work overnight, especially when we're trying to put the ownership on the athlete. There are still athletes and players who are going to push back and who prefer the more passive line and prefer to be lying on a massage bed. But on the flip side, I'm speaking to a good friend who, who you've met, Ben Rosenblatt. You know, the benefit of empowering these athletes to do their own work, to do their own soft tissue work is actually it offloads you as a practitioner. So whether you're a soft tissue therapist, physiotherapist, strength coach, you can now focus in and target the things that you are kind of using a little bit more um, cerebral attention to try and change for them and some of the things they can't help themselves with. You're not having to deal with just, you know, endless rubs, recoveries, or, you know, mobility sessions or all these other things that they can actually handle themselves. So it allows you to do, I think, and, and certainly from the conversation with Ben, better work around that kind of preparation, if you like, and that athlete readiness to train. Yeah, it, it is. It's almost easier to continue to commit to the full process. Like, oh, just lay down here. Now we have 50 soft tissue therapists. I mean, just at some point you realize it doesn't scale. And, yeah. you know, a couple of things. One is um, we really, I want athletes to be at the club, to eat together, to be in a sisterhood, to be in a brotherhood. And then I want them to go away. One of the most important books I read about coaching a few years ago was, uh, it's called The Man Watching. And it's the biography of Anson Dorrance, who is the head coach at women's 
soccer at University of North Carolina. He basically created the entire U.S. professional women's soccer program, highly responsible for the, the, the formation of the Women's World Cup, and he's the winningest coach in American history. Let me just say that again. The winningest coach ever in any sport ever in the United States history is the women's soccer coach for UNC. He's been coaching a long time. And one of the things that is really great about his program is that he, his practices are 90 minutes and they are brutal, 90 minutes. It's all scripted. There's no fluff. There's a reason why he does everything and it's constantly you know, watched. It's constantly evaluated. The, the women that he plays with him constantly compete in practice and those practice metrics are tallied. You and I sprint for the ball. I win. It goes in that I go a win on a sprint. You got a loss on the sprint, right? We track those things so that the intensity and density of training is there. Then the women are off. They're away. And, of course, they have strength conditioning and you know, they're, they're college athletes. But And I work with UNC, so I'm you know, a little bit privy to their strength conditioning coaches. But the idea here is – he really at the heart of this recognizes that players are people, that they're human beings who need a social life. He'll organize games that allow the girls to go out and party after, a, a, you know, because they're in college at Halloween. And so instead of ruining the Halloween, he'll move a game. But then on Monday morning, doesn't matter what happened on the weekend when the girl had the day off, they're running the 110s and, or the 120s. And it's brutal. And here's our expectation. So one of the things that happens now is we can start to say, what do I mean you're sore? You know, let's have higher expectations. Let's raise the bar for what we expect. And that means we start to have to craft minimums that are going to hurt people's feelings, right? That when we do a spot check on sleep or here's my minimum positional competency in the weight room or here's my conditioning standard instead of some subject, hey, I don't feel like you're going very hard at practice. Well, what you- Quantify that for me, coach. That's your feeling because you're, you perceive something, right? Versus, hey, we do have some objective measures, and now we're shifting the burden of responsibility and care and preparation again to the athlete, which means we have to have a culture where the seniors and the pros are like, what are you doing? We don't do that. That's not how we do this. And, bro, you are going to have a short career when you tear a hamstring. Or, you know, hey, this person is still playing – why is this person still playing? And then the young kid is like, they're rich. Why? You know, it doesn't matter for me what your motivation is. If the behavior is, you can do the wrong thing. You can do the, excuse me, you can do the right thing for the wrong reason. It's still the right thing. And as athletes now are starting to become brands, they're starting to own a little bit more ownership in their, their agency and the amount of money and the contracts. There's real money at stake here. And athletes finally, for good or bad, and this may be very unpopular, are starting to realize that they have been treated like chattel for a generation. We have sold a dream to a lot of professional sport athletes that this is it. You will have made it. You'll have all the money you need. You'll have all the fame and adoration. Your dad will love you finally. And then they come through this process, have some bad luck, ankle done, kunk gone, and whew, they've left nothing. They don't, they don't have any skills. They don't have it. So I think athletes are starting to own this from this nefarious process called social media. And what you're starting to see is they're looking around for what is best practice. Then you start to see physios and coaches on the outside saying, hey, choose me for the kickball team. But if you're not coming in and giving that athlete resources, and I'm not talking about gimmickry and, and BS and, and crap. I'm just saying that how do we know – what we're doing is working, right? How do we have an athlete who is ready? One is that she will tell you, and two, you have athletes that win. And you can tell if a team is not fit. You can tell if a team is not sharp. You can tell. And the only thing that matters is, man, how many days did you have on the, on the injury reserve? How many? So how can we begin to control that? This is, if it sounds complicated, welcome to me working with the United States Army trying to help them solve the million non-combat related musculoskeletal injuries in a year. Where do you begin to tug on that knot? How do you begin to change the fact that women, there's a 400% increase in ACLs in girls 14 to 18? Like, where do you begin to tug on that? Instead, what we're like is, oh, we can't control anything. Nothing helps. Nothing works. That's not true. If you do the FIFA recommendations for low extremity injury work for girls 
in your like local, you know, middle school club soccer, massive injury reduction risk, but you don't do it because you didn't value it. You know, what we see is it's a complicated conversation. It's going to take a minute to change. That's okay. Let's just make sure that we're measuring and assessing and that the athlete is the center of the spoke. And they may have a node, a hyper node, which is the director of performance, but everyone is equal around that athlete, but the athlete has to be in charge of her process, which means we need to start in empowering that athlete to understand the process because otherwise it's just, it's complexity that looks like sophistication when it's just complexity and noise. Is it working is a fantastic statement there. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic soundbite, which I'll use again. Is it working? But yeah, that is a good question because, you know, some of the, some of the sort of feelings I have around, you know, and we'll, we'll go, we'll sort of focus back in on the key area of where we, where we started our kind of relationship is the sort of practical aspects of how we apply work in a, in a gym context or a yeah. preparation, in, preparation environment prior to training or prior to a strength session, something like this. Is it working? And a conversation I remember we had was, you know, I think I was applying a lot of different, but throwing a lot of mud and some of it was sticking, mm. basically. And you sort of changed the way I thought about that by saying, okay, well, yeah, you can target. Let's pick up, say, mobility as an example again. Uh, you can target thoracic and an ankle range exercise and a hip mobilization and this all in one preparation session. But if you're doing a little bit of everything on all of those things, are you actually truly making a change? Is it working? And then you said, well, why don't you spend time focusing on one of those things until you cleaned it out and then move on to the next thing? And maybe, by the way, if you address thoracic mobility, you're going to have a knock on effect on other areas as well. Sure enough. That's one of the reasons why I think maybe an approach doesn't work or people misinterpret or misapply some of the work that you've, you've certainly put out there. Um, you know, the second thing is like this kind of minimum optimal dose is if I look at my current job and, and, and again, speaking to friends in football, lying on a foam roller for 30 seconds is is, is pre preparing your tissues, um, you know, preparing you to lift, squat big, jump high, sprint fast, accelerate. No, absolutely not. And I think another misinterpretation around this kind of tissue preparation or preparation work in general and getting yourself in that ready, ready state is that people don't do enough for long enough or frequently enough. Sure. What do you say? What do you say about that? Because I think that's an area that certainly... You know, this is, I've I'm sure changed. I'll say that I, I own this because I, I wasn't clever enough to describe it in the terms or we weren't ready enough to hear it. The first, if we take Supple Leopard as an example, um, the first two thirds of the book is actually about positional competency. It's about the highest expression of movement. And a lot of physios and performance people didn't understand it because they don't speak Olympic lifting. They didn't speak kettlebells. They didn't speak basic gymnastics. So they didn't understand the universal principles between the shoulder is the shoulder. The hip is the hip. You know, if I use you for an example, you, you can do everything. You have a reputation for being a shoulder whisperer, but in your own year, I'm like, well, you know, he does work in professional football and he does work with judo. He does work with track and field and he does work. Well, it turns out the shoulder is the same just shoulder joint and the principles of that are the same. It doesn't matter what the application is, whether it's bench press or pushing overhead and in fact, when you get into the sport, what you realize is pretty much any sport you do, the training ends up looking very similar. The movements that we start to see are very similar. So there is a common language of position that belongs to every human being. And the only difference is how wide my stance is, right? How long my stride is, what the tempo of my, you know, coming out of the blocks will see based on the, the torso length or my femur length, not does the principle hold true or do we have to have a million and one individual principles for every person? Well, if that was true, we, we couldn't teach anyone any technique ever because everyone would be so unique, right? 
What difference is how the sword moves based on your anthropometry, not how you sort, move the sword or the principles of moving the sword. So one of the things we can get to is what are the positions that you deem valuable to your athlete in your sport? How are you assessing those positions daily or weekly as part of the normal process? Because guess what? If you haven't done this for a minute, it's because you have forgotten what it's like to be an athlete. Go ahead and play in a huge match. Don't get home till three in the morning. Have sleep. Show up the next day and we're going to assess your range of motion. And guess what? I know what I know. Didn't, like you're going to be crap. You're going to look like an athlete who just played a huge event or a big tournament and had some stress. Maybe had a newborn at home and, you know, you tore your hamstring back in college. And, you know, like I'm, I'm going to find all of that. So what we want to do is almost begin to say every day is a new snapshot of who you are. And what we're trying to do with readiness is to get back you back to yourself, your base position, your base competency, your base movement, your base feeling as fast as we can every day. That's why we warm up. Well, warm up is also about making the body warm and shifting blood out and all the reasons we warm up. But it's also to reinforce skill and to bring the nervous system back online and to give athletes touch again, right? I, the number of conversations I've had were in college where someone says something like, you know, my, co my coach doesn't want me to swim today, the day before the, uh, you know, the, the big meet. And I'm like, well, is that what your coach said? Or did she say, I don't want you to go destroy yourself in the pool the day before the match, right? If you need touch, go get in the pool. Your coach didn't say, don't touch a soccer ball or an empty barbell the day before you played. In fact, your coach would be like, please touch a soccer ball the day before you play. Let's go ahead and, um, and make sure that you feel light and funny. And you, but like you didn't play three hours of you know, touch you know, football before you went. So ultimately, what we, when we ask that question, I say, well, what are your foundational movements? What are your foundational positions? Then I can step back, apply a filter, and say, well, how are you training those movements? What's your diagnostic? And your diag – uh oh did I lose you, Betty? So your diagnostic may be, hang on a second, I'm going to switch internets here. What happened there, bro? No idea. Welcome, welcome <laughs> to earthquakes and internets and pandemic. So <laughs> what we were saying was, what positions do you value? How are you assessing those positions? Ideally, if you're a coach, you can tell – how your athlete is moving, and what the problem is. This is why we have batting coaches and why some of the best batting coaches in the world are also strength and conditioning coaches. They understand what's under – so when an athlete starts to compensate, oh, okay, here's the magic. How do I know when an athlete does not have access to his position? How do I know when an athlete cannot do what she's trying to do to express the highest expression of – Sprinting. Well, it turns out we know what the foot should do when it hits the ground. It should turn out to 90 degrees and you should run like a duck and your knee should go collapse valgus and your arches should collapse and you should overextend and you should hold your breath. You should run across your body. No, we know what all those cues are. It's called bad running form, right? Not don't run like this. You may get injured. Don't run like this because you're really slow and really an ineffective runner, right? Or sprinter. And so suddenly what ends up happening is if you're a master coach, then you can understand there's something going on. And what we've done for a generation is done a whole bunch of technique drills or what we call skill transfer exercises or drills to teach a skill or reinforce a skill to an athlete. And that skill could be an actual I'm passing the ball under load and speed, or it can be, I need you to work on your foot position here. We do plenty of that, right? This is what you're plant. This is what you're cutting. This is how you're turning and sprinting. But simultaneously now, and this has happened in, within your generation, my generation, we can step back and say, well, I see you have, don't have any internal rotation of your hip. So guess what? It makes pivoting really difficult. Turning to the left, when you have to have internal rotation of the hip to turn to the left, makes turning to the left very difficult. And you're going to have to do a whole bunch of wonky things at high speed. But because your brain is beautiful, you'll solve that problem. And because you're one of the world's best athletes, you'll solve that problem. But my experience has been for the last 20 years that if I gave athletes their positional competency back to their core competency, the normative ranges, and again, improve their normal ranges, maybe they'll never chase it because they're professional sportsters who are going to always look like the pattern of their sport. But if I work to improve and restore their positions to this minimum competency where I see less compensation, then what ends up happening is the athlete uses that range and immediately is like, man, it was so much easier to go out onto the field. I remember I just did a hip opening drill, like a really 
terrible movement prep where I just got the hips open. We grounded around, right? And just really simple stuff on the ground. And there was this all pro linebacker at the Saints who was like, just had a frown on his face the whole time, right? He's been there forever. He's seen everything, but he played along, right? 60 minutes cameras are there. He's watching. He's cool. And then guess what happens? I'm in the elevator with him later on at the hotel. And he's like, my hips felt really good today. Practice was easy. Thanks. And he gives me a knuckle bump. And what all I did was give him access to his native range, which made his job easier. And guess what? There's buy-in, right? And more importantly, that athlete is smart enough to say that made me better. I don't ever have to sell that thing again. So if again, we put the filter back on, I'm going to ask you, what are your core movements that you're training with your athletes in the gym? Hard for, and every one of those things has a start position and finish position that expresses a normative range. That's why we train them. This is why coaches say things like, I like the bench press. It ties the arms to the body. Well, it turns out learning how to bench teaches you how to create a stable shoulder when the arm's in front of you, which makes you a better sprinter, for example, or a better tackler, for example, or more stable when you grab someone's gi and drop the elbow down in the short lever position because you know how to create a ton of rotation stability in that position because you bench. So what does bad benching look like? Flare, right? Elbow flare, shoulder transits forward. Well, it's easy to see that. That's crappy technique where you can't handle large loads. So suddenly we can take a step back further and say, hey, I see that you're having a difficult time practicing these movements. It's not just bigger pecs make you a better sprinter. Wouldn't that be nice, right? But that's not, you know, coordination is just as important as the physiology. And then we can step back and say, well, what are the components to that? And what are the best ways to address that? Sometimes it's skill, right? And that's why we use skill position exercises, skill transfer exercises, technique. That's why we have all these technique coaches all over, right? The goalie has a goalie coach, the midfielders have a mid, right? There's a defensive coach, offensive coach. But then we can sort of start to say, well, hey, if it's a positional mechanical issue, I wonder what that is. Well, it's because you don't drink water, you're hyper, you know, you don't sleep, you're inflamed, your tissues feel like crap because you went vegan this season, right? Like all of a sudden I can really ask all of those questions or I can say, hey, guess what? You played 90 minutes in the, in the Olympics and then you sat on a bus and your quads got this magical thing called stiffness because the first thing your body does is lay down a whole bunch of fascia after large loads. It doesn't build muscles after that. It builds fascia so you can handle the, the adaptation from the muscular development. So now you start to see, oh, look at all the tools I have to improve what position. If you don't understand what the principles of position are and at least know what normative range is, then how can you possibly understand compensation or what your athlete is screaming to you when she can't turn a bat or kick a ball or throw or tackle or ride a mountain bike. And suddenly at least we can start to simplify the process. And then based on your available resources, you can start to ask what's the best way to give this athlete her positional competency back. What are the environmental considerations that I can lay over on top of that, that I can control for sleep, hydration, nutrition, stress, right? All of those things. And then all I had to do was set you up and just say, hey, who's the best team today, right? Not who is the best compensators who had the best genetics to buffer the worst mechanics the longest. That's the problem. Because real, real injury is going to happen, right? You're going to get tackled. Yeah, there's not much you can do about that. The, uh, the uncontrollable, certainly. Um, I'm going to sort of take a bit of a right turn now and go towards this kind of idea of, of the one-to-one. -one. You know, some athletes like, that one-to-one -one coaching, other athletes are happy to have remote delivery using apps or other tools. Um, I know, I know it's an area you focused on and you, again, it's about scaling this and scaling the message and getting good information out to people. But you know, what, what do you think? Can you, can you truly transfer that one-to-one -one hands-on to a wider population, you know, using an app. Have, how successful have you been with that? And what, what do you think some of the issues are around that? You know, ultimately, let's, let's call a spade a spade and say that if I put a world-class athlete with a world-class coach, that's the best outcome. Hmm. Okay, well, there's 5,000 soldiers on this aircraft carrier and one physio. Great. How's it going for you? 
how, how many physios are on the team? How many massage therapists do you have? How many individual? So what you start to see is that, again, you need to go through and say, well, what can we control for? And, you know, if you're a high school team, you know, uh, here's how high school kids are using our app. And in our app, we have a movement assessment um, where that allows people to self-assess. And you have, we have a red, a yellow, and a green because that's good enough, right? Because, again, if you have, let's say you're missing 10 degrees of hip flexion, is that really impacting your performance and mechanics? I don't know. Well, today we're going to squat as deep as you can without compensating. So, and we're going to take you through dynamic warm ups. So, we're going to at least touch those positions in sport. But if you're missing 50% of your range of motion in your internal, right, you don't have any internal rotation in your shoulder, man, or uh, you have no internal rotation, you're missing 100% of a critical range, at least we can start to say, hey, let's focus on. So, let's put it on our problem list. And the problem list could include sleep, stress, hydration, nutrition, crap warm up. Right. I mean, you can put whatever you want on the problem list of things you're going to control for. But one of the things that I want to start doing is what, you know, how many times as a young physio, someone comes to me and I'm like, huh, you don't have any hip extension, like zero. You can't extend your hip. That means your glute that you can't even flex your glute because your hips are so stiff. So whose problem is that? Who, who's, who owns that? Don't you want to give a shit about the fact that you can't extend your hip and you're a sprinting athlete? You think that's important? You know, so. Ultimately, what we start to see is, okay, I need to make sure that the coaches are programming these things. So I go into big strength conditioning programs and be like, let's look at the positions and time spent in these shapes, right? And that shape in this example is hip extension. So suddenly we see, well, I'm like, okay, there's no split squat. There's no lunge. There's no Bosch, you know, hip flexion to step up onto box. Right. And suddenly when you start to look through people's programming as a way of positional restoration, positional competency, positional reminding, it becomes super transparent. Then then the question is, well, do you bench two times a week or three times a week in the NFL? I have no idea. I'm not a I'm not a NFL lineman coach. That's you know, that's 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 a I don't like cinnamon in my cookies kind of thing, right? No more cilantro in my oatmeal cookies. Right. So that is a personal preference. Right. That's not tactics. Right. That, or, or that's that's it is tactics. It's not principles and, and minimum. You know, here's a good example. If I take it, if you if you want to see how good your program is, drop your athletes into anyone else's program. How well do they do? Drop in any movement assessment. How well do they do? And if your program is robust, your athletes will thrive. They're not going to shine in someone's program that does special drills that athletes have practiced a thousand times but they will be able to hit the positions and shapes and do whatever. And that's ultimately what our goal for is transferability. My job as a physio coach is to get the athlete as ready as I can to be coached by their position or their team. That is the end of my deal. The athlete comes off and I say, what are the things that I can help you with so that you can reduce that session cost and have higher training volumes and densities during the week, Right. And that means that the athlete is better prepared, that athlete can handle more volume, and that athlete can do, you know, what does Pavel say? Lift as heavy as you can, as often as you can, as fresh as you can. That's so easy. That's all I need to do. Just lift as heavy as I can, as often as I can, as fresh as I can. Wow. When, what days we lift? Well, we have 20 minutes on Tuesdays and Thursdays to lift. Oh, okay. That's going to be tricky. Uh, I have no way of assessing how beat up you are, and you're not doing a good job managing that. And and you haven't ever power cleaned your whole life or swung a kettlebell or done a goblet squat. Wow, we have a lot of teaching to do here. And, you know, good news is, you know, I think we apply this unfair rubric on top of strength and conditioning coaches and performance programs because I'm like, well, your athletes are going out and playing 90 minutes on the pitch plus all the time in the practice with zero dorsiflexion and a collapsed arch and they're running terribly and they're overextended and they hold their breath when they run. So you didn't think it was a problem, but it's, you know, I'm here to clean up all the problems. And so what we see is that the task is so complex. And in high school, particularly, coaches have zero education on training kids or working with kids. They have zero education on movement or nutrition or sleep or those things. And their job is to get kids organized fast enough to go play a game. So where is the rest of it going to start to fall into? And what you see is that it doesn't. No one owns the problem until... Someone gets injured and they're like, oh, what happened? Ah, let's apply some complexity to the system. But I'm like, wow, your kid Snapchats her girlfriend 
you know, at two in the morning. Like, I think there's one of the problems. We can control for that, right? Your kid doesn't eat whole foods. That we can control for that. You have a crap warm up. We can control for that. Your kids aren't very skilled movers. And so suddenly we realized, man, we don't have to play a perfect game today. We have to play a better game today. And my job as a coach, physio, is to improve the ball. And so instead of adding what felt like complexity, here's a good example. I, I know this is a good athlete. Um, I know world champion, superstar, and I watch their programming. And I, it's not my role. I'm not their strength conditioning coach. So I don't comment on it, right? I'm there to bring resources and help with positions. But I don't see a lot of good strength and conditioning going on. But it's not my job. This athlete owns the process completely. And I don't want to – I'm not in there to try to take someone's job or do other things. But what you can see is I understand why this athlete may not be having the success that he wishes he could have because he's doing a lot of things that smell like strength and conditioning or super complex that feels like hard work but isn't touching any of these fundamental shapes. And so what we see is 60 minutes of busy work and not a good way to measure that outcome. And ultimately, is it working? Is it not? Better, same, worse. One or zero. Did you win or not? And that's the only thing. And especially in professional sports, you know, we should be evaluating the success of our strength conditioning program by, you know, are our athletes prepared to play and are we winning? And if it's, it's easier in an individual sport, right? Boy, your water sucked and you were slow, <laughs> you know? And, um, and then you have – if we look at Shikari Richardson right now, you know, we just had the uh, Prefontaine meet, and Shikari is this incredible track athlete who got popped for smoking marijuana, right, and banned for 30 days and wasn't able to go to the Olympics. Like, it, terrible. And then guess what? The amount of media scrutiny on that person, all of the pressure, all of the side, she just had a terrible race at the Prefontaine, right? She raced against Olympians who were happy and, and won and had won their medals and were peaking, and she has been not competing for a, over a month and she had a terrible race. And I'm like, well, of course she did. Like how you couldn't control for the amount of pressure and management in that. Right. And that's not because she's not a talented athlete. It's because we couldn't, she didn't have the resources or the blinders to control for that. So again, coming back in my field, the thing I focus on positional competency and the expression of that position. And it just turns out that I better know something about sleep and nutrition and psychology. And then I also need to know what your system looks like and who owns what. And it turns out that shifting some of that responsibility to the athlete so that they can understand that they don't have the positional competency to do the sport, that's expanding what we mean by sport. It's expanding what we mean by, hey, it's not just who can compensate the most and is the best talent on top of that. You know, it's who can play the longest. You know, I ended up with a specialization where I was working with a lot of athletes near the end of their career. And like I specialize in athletes between 35 and 45 who are playing the NFL and tennis and all of these other sports because they were like, hey, what I've been doing isn't working anymore. And I'm like, well, let me just give you back your range of motion and let's do a little training in those positions. And guess what happened? They were able to extend their careers. And if you work with Levi Leipheimer, for example, he was really good at bike racing. And so all I needed to do was keep him physically able enough where he could use his psychological acuity and his vast experience racing bikes to still win. He didn't have to have the hottest engine because he was still the best bike racer. And I think there are some times where we're missing out on, you know, the potentiation of expanding how long we can compete and how excellent we can compete and using all of that experience to our benefit just because we did something poor on the front side. Mate, it's it's always interesting to hear from you and, and an update. And I know you know you've got some precious time available, but I'm really also wanting to talk about some next steps for you. And we spoke before about an upcoming uh, book deal. So mm. uh, can you tell us a bit about this, this this new book that you're going to be involved in called I think it's Built to Move, if I'm correct. Um, E.O. Wilson is one of my heroes, evolutionary biologist, evolution psychologist. There's a book that every coach to read called Consilience, which is the unification of knowledge, which is really about trying to pull all of these fields together into a unified whole. So imagine a unified field theory about humans. That's really what, we're, what I'm interested in, right? And um, in all its complexity and dirtiness, I love all of that. I think this is, it's, it's a worthy thing. But Ian Wilson says, the highest calling of science to, to 
inform and improve the humanities. And pure science has a good reason, but his reason for science is to improve the humanities. My understanding of sport and per sports performance is the highest calling of sport and sports performance is to improve society. And that can be through giving people common cause, can give for people to be able to relate to their families by supporting their team, can also be saying, here's what best practice is. I mean, you know, the work of someone like Nick Gill, the All Blacks, he is really talented. He's a user. He's a really excellent triathlete. He's an incredible athlete. And he's a really sophisticated programmer. And then he wrote a book called Health Yourself about trying to change the health of people in Australia or New Zealand. Sorry, that was a total faux pas there. And uh, that's a good example where um, we should be taking what we're learning in the laboratory of sports performance and trying to take those best principles because it's our teaching hospital. It's what we understand. And I really think a lot of what we've come to understand about best practices around human condition have come out of sport, nutrition, sleep, you know, performance mechanics. And so if the highest calling of sport is used as a teaching hospital, a test kitchen, then the consummation of the sport promise is to actually take those lessons and principles back. So Nick Gill not only took his a moment, because he's also a professor, to write a book about trying to improve the health of his country, but he also, what he does at the very top, trickles all the way down through all of the rugby in New Zealand, all of it. So he really sets the tone about what the kids are going to do. And so suddenly kids are eating differently and they're front squatting. And, you know, what you're starting to see is this full consummation of idea through the stratum. So Built to Move is taking all of our experience of working with all of the savage people that I know and the coaches and the athletes and the experience in the teams and say, here's what best practice looks like that isn't diet and isn't exercise. It's how to be a durable person so that you can be 100 years old because you're going to be 100 years old. And, you know, again, if you've done both your ACLs and torn both your Achilles, yeah, chances are you're probably cruising for a knee replacement and you may, may or not be very functional when you're very old. And what I'm really interested in is how well you played when you were 24, but I'm also interested in that you go to 100 and your worldview is, is big. So we can ask the question, um, how's it going? And I can apply any test to that question. How's it going? Well, how's our diabetes? How's obesity? How's musculoskeletal injury? It's how's surgery? Like how's depression? How's suicide? Choose something. Choose something and tell me it's better. And what you can't right now, you, you're not. Like every single one of those things is a failure of sport to fulfill its contract with humanity and society, which is to improve it other than entertainment. Because I think really sport is greater than entertainment. And what we're trying to do with Built to Move is say, hey, look, if Supple Leopard, if I didn't address any of these things, it's because the book is already like 500 pages long. So this is the heart of Supple Leopard. If we're also interested in going, so how, what's the fastest way up Everest? That's the conversation you and I are having. But I'm like, shouldn't we get everyone to base camp first before we start talking about the route up, up Everest? And so what we're trying to do is get everyone to base camp. And it turns out those are unskilled, but really are the foundations of what it means to be a human being. Breathing, balance sleep, some foundations of nutrition, right? And it's really a sneaky book about your movement as a vital sign, your physicality as a vital sign. What is, let's expand what physical practice means. You know, and so, you know, I think if we can improve the ball a little bit and take what we want, then I will have fulfilled the promise of so many of the work of the men and women I work with as coaches. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Um, a lot of the you work you've least, done over you can, you can give it to your mom, right? That's what's nice. Look at my mate did. <laughs> like, that's, that's the idea. I'm like, you want to be ready? You want to play sport? Then just do these things first. <laughs> well, I was going to give you a compliment there, but, you know, you interrupted me. But um, <laughs> that's okay, uh, mate. What you've, what you've shared out there, and you're very transparent about your views and very transparent with sharing a load of stuff that's out there for people to use. And I've certainly used it. Myself. I'm a user. Um, myself and what, what people don't see I think is that you're very generous with your time so not just these kind of podcast conversations but I've introduced you to people Evie Casagrande I've introduced you to Ben Rosenblatt and my network and you've been really generous about about giving up some of your time and they're they're also good people who are part of the wider network here trying to do good stuff in this industry 
Um, so thanks for that. Thanks for all the stuff you've done. And, and again, thanks today for this conversation. It's been, uh, it's been a really good one. I'm sure the listeners will enjoy it. And, um, you know, we'll share all of this stuff in the show notes so that pe- people can know where to find you. But once again, mate, thanks a lot. I look forward to our foot race. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to get in training. I've got some hills outside my place. I'm going to do a couple of hill sprints in a minute just to see if I can tune up. I I don't know what it was. I knew I was having a chat with you today, but I have I have hill sprints on the on the menu. I got to go run the hill too, you know. And just so if you're listening, finally understand why we're saying hill sprints because we can actually improve your force production physiology, but decrease your skill requirements. That's why we run hills. A is that you get overload, but B you don't have to have as much hip extension or hip flexion. So it's a really good way of protecting old men from themselves <laughs> i think that's and old women too the, I, I have equal opportunity yeah right? evie evie i'm talking about you out here because uh and let me just finally <laughs> say um i people ask me sometimes you know who what are my influences and i'm like i work in the most exciting time of the best coaches in the history of coaching the best performance coaches and your network you know if I could be an athlete under Evie, I would do that. If I could give my daughters to Evie in a second, I would. And what we're seeing is this rise of the most intelligent, savage group of coaches who are really, it's, it's, our, it's our turn. And if we don't improve the ball this time, shame on us. But it's the, the people I get to work with is I'm a coach and I'm a coach's fan and I'm a fan of coaching. Fantastic, mate. Love it. Thanks, brother. 